Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Anton Korinek. I'm a Rubenstein Fellow at the Center on Regulation and Markets at Brookings and a Professor of Economics at the University of Virginia. I am pleased and honored to welcome all of you to our fireside chat today. And I'm especially happy to welcome Joe Stiglitz to our virtual studio. Our topic today is AI, innovation, and welfare. Joseph Stiglitz is a university professor at Columbia, and he's also the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute, among many other positions of thought leadership. He's a recipient of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics and a former chief economist of the World Bank and chairman of the US Council of Economic Advisors. Cho has made pioneering contributions throughout all subfields of economics, but over the past decade, he has been particularly active in research on technological progress and inequality. I have had the honor of collaborating with Joe on several papers in this area, and two of them are listed on the web page from which you are viewing this event. In the interest of full disclosure, Joe was also my dissertation advisor. Before we start, let me thank the team that has made today's event possible. Sanjay Patnaik, the director of the Brookings Center on Regulation and Markets, and Megan Waring, our events manager. We have obtained lots of interesting questions from all of you during the sign-up process for this event. Unfortunately, they were too numerous for me uh, to include all of them uh, to our distinguished guest, but I will do my best as we go through the materials uh, to incorporate as many of your questions as possible into our conversation. The geopolitical context of our event reminds us how much is at stake when we speak about ensuring that technological progress increases welfare. Because every time we turn on the news, we are reminded that technology can also be used to propagate misinformation and divide us, to suppress people, and even to kill and destroy more efficiently. Joe, you have emphasized repeatedly that it's important that we ensure that technological progress benefits everybody in society, not only because that's the ethical thing to aim for, but also because it is crucial for the stability of our society. The stakes are no less than the survival of our Western democratic systems and social market economies. Can you tell us more? Well, the, a good point, place to begin the discussion is to realize that over the past 250 years, we've had amazing uh, technological progress. Uh, science, the Enlightenment institutions uh, have led to higher standards of living, increased longevity. It's hard now to remember, but if you look at the centuries before 1700, 1750, for at least as long as we have data, dating back a couple thousand years, there was no significant increases in standards of living. And yet in the last 250 years, uh, it's been enormous. And yet, and yet, there is not the kind of support that you would have thought for what I sometimes call the Enlightenment values, the Enlightenment institutions, uh, the science, uh, universities, uh, the mechanisms of social, political, and economic organization, rule of law, democracy, separation of powers, a whole set of, of ideas that we have developed that enable us to cooperate together. Given the benefits, question is, why isn't there more support? Well, part of the reason there isn't more support is the benefits have not been equally shared. Now, we ought to be recognized. Everybody has benefited. You know, our life expectancy today is so much greater. We just take it for granted. Our standard of living, even the people at the bottom are so much better than they were, than they would have been if you did a thought experiment if they were born 250 years ago. So everybody has benefited. 
but some have benefited so much more than others. And uh, this is contrary to the way economists typically look at things. We do judge things to some extent in a relative position. So even if everybody's benefited, if some have benefited a lot more, the people at the bottom still see themselves as struggling because what they think of as acceptable has moved up uh, with the success uh, of our society. We also, you know, one of the points that uh, has been made by the IMF, by my own research, my book, The Price of Inequality, by a lot of other people, is that when you have a divided society, economic inequality, not only is politics affected, but even the economy may not perform as well. So even from the narrower perspective of economics, uh, not sharing things better, not perfectly, but better, can have large costs. And finally, the point I would make is, well, as economists, we like to think that everything comes back to economics. We also have to recognize that there are lots of other things uh, going on, that ideas matter, ideologies matter, that if we look at some of the places where uh, populism, nationalism, uh, anti-democratic values, authoritarianism have flourished, include countries that have done relatively well. So you cannot, there's not a one-to-one -one link between economic performance and even economic inequalities and the lack of uh, support for these enlightenment values and uh, that I just uh, described. And that makes sense, thank you. Now let's start perhaps with the optimistic perspective uh, and let's look at the classic positive effects of progress, the textbook story of technological progress, uh, so to say. And that textbook story is that technological progress benefits everybody, that it lifts all boats. So let's take an example of an innovation in which it seems relatively unambiguous that it improves people's lives. Say that we invent a new battery that holds more power at less cost and is also better for the environment. Can you walk us through that best case scenario and through the economics of how an innovation like that would both improve living standards and grow our economy? Yeah, well, and, let me begin with an even uh, simpler case. Uh, an innovation that produces more output with a given input means that everybody could supply the inputs that they had before work the same amount that they did before. And we have more goodies more goodies to spread among everybody. And so that would be a case where everybody uh, could be made better off. And I said, could be made better off, but that doesn't mean that they will be made better off because uh, whenever you have a change in technology, it has the potential of changing the balance of market forces it changes demand and supply curves. That means it changes the market equilibrium, bargaining power uh, in a competitive market. It just changes market uh, prices. That means that it is possible that some groups in the market equilibrium will be actually worse off. So while the pie is bigger, some groups will get so much smaller slice of that bigger pie that they're actually worse off. Now, again, in principle, we could take some of the slice, the bigger slice from the gainers and give it to the losers. But there are two problems. One is the guys who've gained may not want to give up 
and they may have political power. We'll maybe talk about that later, but the economic inequality gets related then to political inequality, and that may impede the redistributions that would enable the, us to ensure that everybody's better off. There's a second thing that could go wrong, which is redistributions are not costless. We have to have taxes, we have to do other things, and those themselves may make it very difficult to achieve outcomes that make everybody better off. In addition, I think I hope we will be able to talk uh, later on, uh, it's not always the case that innovations make society better off. Uh, we, we are drummed, uh, that idea is drummed in our head, but you began the conversation talking a little bit about uh, mis and disinformation, uh, innovations in military uh, that enhance the ability to kill. Uh, there are many other innovations that may increase the profits of somebody, but don't necessarily increase societal well-being. I want to return to some of those negative effects of innovation again in one moment, but let's stay uh, for a little bit more on the optimistic side. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you view as the particular benefits that innovations in the area of AI can contribute to our economy? And how can they contribute to social welfare? One uh, of the central aspects of artificial intelligence is that you, you can think of this as the third step in uh, uh, the innovation revolution. So the first was uh, that we developed machines that were stronger than us. It could do things physically that we couldn't do. Uh, and uh, we would talk about a car having so many horsepower, let alone human power. So it was physical strength. And then we, in, in the middle of the last century, we discovered that uh, we invent made innovations that uh, could uh, compute faster, can do calculations faster. We could add, but they could add a lot more faster, uh, a lot faster than we could. But the AI does something that we didn't originally think that somebody, a machine could do better. It could learn faster, learn within a well-defined area. And it, uh, uh, well-defined, we have to be able to train it. There's a whole set of, of circumstances where we, we know how to, uh, have uh, the AI learn. It can learn how to play games like Go, but actually solve lots of very difficult things that would take us years and years, maybe decades to learn. So um, that ability to learn combined with the ability to process and store information has given us the ability to solve problems that were inconceivable uh, a short while ago, uh, you know, uh, right, an example we're all experiencing uh, right now is uh, the quick uh, identification of the pathogens that, COVID, that caused COVID-19 and the development of the mRNA uh, vaccines. Um, that's uh, an example of the advances in biology. These complex molecules we would never have been able to study, learn about them without AI and the uh, computing uh, technologies that uh, we have. So in, in uh, many areas of science today, uh, AI is playing a, a, a very uh, critical role. Um, and in many ways, AI, the speed of AI, may be particularly relevant as we enter worlds in which changes occur more rapidly, uh, partly because of technological change. But there's an interesting dynamic here. AI causes faster change, and we need AI then to cope with the faster change that AI is in fact causing. You emphasized before 
that there are several ways in which things can go wrong that move us away from the optimistic scenario. And uh, the first way uh, was still under the assumption that markets are working well, but you observed that there can be redistributions. Uh, what do you view as the particular risks of AI in that context? Well, first, you know, uh, we ha have to re recognize it's very hard to imagine a world with perfect markets. Because one of the things about perfect markets is we would all have insurance against the changes that AI might bring about. And then there wouldn't be the redistributive consequences because we would have been insured against those redistributive consequences. But we don't have that kind of insurance and it's almost inconceivable for some of the reasons that I've explicated in my work in uh, asymmetric and imperfect information, those insurance markets just don't uh, exist. But obviously in the absence of those, uh, those insurance markets, uh, innovation, AI, can uh, lead to a uh, decrease in the well-being of workers, especially workers, uh, unskilled workers, uh, workers um, whose jobs are more routine because AI and robotization more generally uh, has the effect of replacing workers. So one way of thinking about it for those, you know, are used to thinking demanding supply, we can create artificially more humans uh, or more machines that act like humans. And in that way, we increase the supply of human-like services, and that will diminish the relative return of humans and at least lower their relative position in our society. And so that's uh, the dramatic uh, the concern about uh, what is called, what Hicks called, labor-saving innovation. Innovations which at current market wages and prices, interest rates and so forth, reduce the demand for labor. And if it reduces the demand for labor at current wages, that means to clear the labor market, uh, wages will have to go down. And equally, even if you don't, and I, uh, don't believe that labor markets are competitive, and I don't believe that. It even further weakens the bargaining power of workers because now workers have to compete against machines. Machines don't join unions. They don't give you trouble. Uh, uh, they don't go on strike. They do sometimes break down, but they don't get COVID-19. And there are many advantages that machines have. So it changes the bargaining power of workers and especially workers for whom AI is a, an effective replacement. And that creates greater inequality and greater inequality has all kinds of societal consequences uh, of the kind that you hinted at the beginning of our conversation. That's a really powerful way of describing the labor market effects of AI. Now, if we add market imperfections to the mix, you have shown in some of your work that innovation may even reduce output and make everybody worse off in the economy. Can you explain how that could happen? Um, well, there's some uh, obvious uh, examples where in uh, economies with market uh, imperfections, uh, innovations are uh, directed at exploiting uh, those imperfections. Like an obvious example, we have a lot of innovations that increase, that have the effect of increasing market power, increasing monopoly power. And uh, we see that in some of the platforms. Now we know that in order for markets to generate efficient outcomes, we have to have competition. But if innovations undermine competition, then they're undermining the basis on which the market economy
functions and the basis on which we have confidence that the market economy is efficient. Example, going back to AI, uh, one of the things that AI has done is been to uh, uh, the, the uh, platforms get an enormous amount of data. The few platforms then have a competitive advantage over those who don't have that data. More data is a key input into AI. And that means it accelerates and amplifies market power. But then they use that market power, not only maybe for efficiency, but also for exploitation. One form of exploitation is being able to have targeted pricing. So technically economists say they have the ability to extract consumer surplus. We used to think about those firms that are more profitable are delivering better goods. But that may not be the case. The firms that are more profitable may be the firms that are better able to exploit market power, to amplify market power, to exploit individual vulnerabilities, to target individuals and extract their consumer surplus. So the old theory was that innovation gave rise to more profits because it made goods that were cheaper or more to the liking of individuals. Now we realize that innovation can give rise to more profits by en enabling better, ex more exploitation of a whole variety of kinds. Now, that's the most obvious example, but then there are uh, some uh, examples that, again, are, are, are fairly familiar to many individuals where you see the ability of AI and innovations to explicitly exploit uh, market imperfections in ways that aggravate them rather than remedy them. Uh, one example, for instance, we have regulations, uh, regulations to protect us uh, in, um, against uh, uh, when we go into a taxi, regulations in hotels uh, to make sure that they're safe and uh, clean. And, you know, oh, oh. we have a whole set of regulations that make our society function better. But one of the things that some of the platforms have done has been to make profits out of regulatory arbitrage. In other words, getting around the regulations by circumventing, you know, Airbnb may circumvent the regulations designed for hotels. Uh, Uber may circumvent the regulations that are designed for taxis. And the profits may be partly due to a service that was not better provided, an increase in efficiency. But part of the profits comes from uh, regulatory arbitrage. Another example that I've written about uh, a, a, a while ago is uh, we have regulations against front running and financial markets. But uh, there's been a lot of writing about uh, flash trading as being an innovation, the new technologies that where you have trading in nanoseconds that have no social benefit that anybody has been able to discover, but is a 21st century version of front running with all the disadvantages, all the undermining of the informational role of markets. So th these are all examples where actually markets are weakened uh, the efficiency of markets are weakened. Uh, two more examples. Uh, no, 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 stop. Uh, one of, you know, the, the, uh, we're used to thinking um, 
uh, one of the reasons that markets are efficient in general is that everybody faces the same prices. I don't know if you remember back to your basic undergraduate economics course, it was the fact that everybody faces the same prices that ensures that the marginal cost and every marginal benefits of everybody are the same. And that's the net condition that generates uh, the efficiency of the market, the first welfare theorem. Well, I mentioned before the ability with AI to target, charge different individuals, different prices. What does that mean? It totally undermines the basis of the efficiency of the market economy. So the irony here is that this innovation actually destroys the theorem which, on which we rely for the efficiency uh, of the market economy. Now, there's one more uh, example I wanna give, um, somewhat more complicated, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to explain it, but it goes back uh, to uh, the, what is called the theory of the second best. Take an economy which is competitive, that works pretty well, except, for instance, there are not a full set of risk markets. The theory of the second best says improvements in one market without solving the other problems may actually lead us away from, may actually make welfare lower, may make everybody worse off. And the example that I, I analyzed uh, almost 40 years ago <laughs> was one where we had uh, two islands uh, that couldn't trade with each other because the cost of transportation was too great. And there was risk and the risk were negatively correlated and there's no risk market. And then we have an innovation that allows them to trade. We reduce the cost of transportation. And now the result of that is that they can trade with each other. That has the effect of with the negative correlation and output of stabilizing prices. But because there are imperfect risk markets, stabilizing prices with variability in output increases the variability in income. And the net result of that was that everybody in both islands was worse off. Now that was a stylized example, but it brings home the point that when we, the world we live in, it, we're never gonna get to a perfect market. We're never gonna solve, uh, eliminate all the uh, market imperfections. And creating some uh, innovations which would in a perfect market have been welfare increasing may in an imperfect market be welfare decreasing. And again, let me give one practical example. Structured finance, many people thought, big move in the right direction. In fact, many people say structured finance is a step in creating what was called the error de brew markets, completing the markets, making risk markets better. Not perfect, but making them better and therefore welfare enhancing. We all know that in the presence of imperfect information and perfect risk market, structured finance helped create the financial crisis of 2008 with such devastating global consequences. I don't think anybody really thinks that it was a welfare enhancement once we take into account all the adverse effects. Thank you, Joe. I think. Uh, these were really a number of very good examples for this theory of the second best, for this theory of how making things a little better in one market may actually lead to welfare losses. Now, when technological innovation makes some in society worse off, and you have already emphasized that 
people are not well insured against uh, these uh, downsides of technological progress, then we'll have greater need for social protection, for social insurance. But at the same time, the losers may also lose some of their political bargaining power. How concerned should we be that there could be this type of political economic amplification effect that as some people lose out from progress, they also lose some of their bargaining power and the insurance institutions that are meant to protect them are in fact abolished. Yeah, I am very worried. And, and it, it was one of the uh, central points in my book, The Price of Inequality. Um, basically, there's a nexus where you have economic inequality can and often does give rise to political inequality. And then political inequality gives rise to more economic inequality. Whether it does or not really depends on the political institutions. But if you have a democracy like the United States with Citizens United, where you, you, you have a set of provisions that allow money to have disproportionate role in politics, then if there is more wealth and income inequality, those with more income and wealth may use that wealth to uh, campaign for uh, initiatives for a, a legislative framework that uh, will serve their interests. And uh, this can take two forms. Uh, they can argue um, that we don't, we want to have low taxes uh, and not engage in redistribution, not have social protection. And they argue against social protection, but more broadly, they have an incentive for having a weak state, a uh, limited collective action. Why? Because with strong collective action, you are more likely not only to engage in um, the kind of redistribution or social protection that I just described, but you may engage in market regulation. Market regulation includes stopping exploitation of market power, individual vulnerabilities, all the market imperfections. And when you look at the sources of wealth in a country like the United States, one recognizes that a very large fraction of those at the top have gotten a significant, not necessarily all, but a significant fraction of their income and wealth from one form or another of what we economists call rank seeking, from market exploitation, for exploiting vulnerabilities, uh, from exploiting uh, one form or, or another of market imp imperfection. And so they wanna maintain that. You know, example that we all see, uh, the coal oil companies want to be able to continue to exploit the environment, even though we all know it imposes enormous social costs on the rest of us and on our future generations. Uh, we know that there's a social cost of carbon. We know that the social cost of carbon uh, conservatively is $100, $125, $150 a ton. But we can't get the legislation to implement that because the vested interests are adamant about maintaining their wealth that they derive from exploiting the environment and thereby exploiting all the rest of us. Now, I wanna say that this is not inevitable. You know, it, 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 it is uh, something you asked me, am I worried? I am worried. There are some countries which, at least in the past, have taken another logic to this. Some of the Scandinavian countries, small, said, we 
are small countries, we have to be open to globalization and innovation. And they've said, we are committed democracies. How do you square the circle of being a committed democracy and innovation and committed to innovation and globalization, which they have to be given their size, knowing the potential adverse distribution effects? Well, the answer is we have to make sure that a vast majority of our citizens benefit from innovation and globalization. And so that's why they set up uh, a framework of shared prosperity. So they view that as a necessity given their commitment to democracy. Now, what worries me now, and going back to your first question, very in the first remarks in the very beginning, that if innovation is not benefiting the majority and one wants to be able to maintain the market, the power, the political power to continue with inequality and exploitation, there's only one answer. And that is leave democracy, undermine democracy. You can't square the circle. And unfortunately, it seems uh, there is a to me there's a lot of worry. That is the direction that some part of the United States is taking. That's indeed a very worrying concern. Now let's try to be a little bit more optimistic. And okay. um, we, we have both made this case uh, in one of our joint papers that, that we should attempt to steer technological progress. That policy should take a more active role in affecting what direction technological progress should take. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And in particular, how do these ideas also apply to artificial intelligence? So first, let me try to explain a little bit more about the idea that, that there are different kinds of innovations. Um, I talked to before about innovations that created uh, robots or AI that essentially replace labor. What Hicks called labor saving innovation, innovations that, in, that lowered the demand for labor at existing wages. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the 20th century, we had a lot of innovations that increased the demand for labor at existing wages. And uh, those were labor using, not labor saving innovations. They drive up the wages. And that was part of the reason we had that kind of shared prosperity. Uh, interestingly, in the last part of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, that historical experience led many economists to think that innovation automatically would benefit everybody. You, you know, a rising tide lifts uh, all boats. But there was no inev inevitability of that. It was a particular historical episode. And we're now going through another historical episode where that may not be, go there's strong, strong reasons uh, for that, believe that that is not going on. Conceptually, one way of thinking about the distinction is a little twist in language that I sometimes use. We talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, AI, and the other one I sometimes talk about is IA, intelligence assisting innovation. And an example of that is the telescope or the microscope. Our eyes could only see certain things. And then we had these instruments that enabled us to see more. We became better humans, if you want to think about it that way. We became more powerful in what we could do. So that's just an example of how innovations can actually make us more productive. Uh, and that's uh, the example where it could increase uh, wages. Now, 
there are many things that affect the direction of uh, innovation. Uh, we could be uh, using our scarce resources, research resources, to figure out how to replace unskilled labor, make machines that are like automatic tellers. Or we can use our scarce resources to uh, discover better ways of making renewable energy. You know, these are both research projects. Uh, economics is about resource allocation. And we could allocate our research teams to solving one problem or another. We all make, uh, uh, all of us as researchers decide what to work on. And we could work on one problem or another. Uh, I could have been a physicist that I debated whether I would, I almost was. And that was a, a, a decision. And uh, uh, so this is a matter of resource allocation. And uh, the first insight that I wanna emphasize is there is no theorem that says markets solve the problem of allocating research resources efficiently. The, the market solution to the pace and direction of innovation has no optimality properties. Uh, the, the, I've already hinted at that. What, what drives innovation is profits and there's not a clear link between those kinds of profits and social well-being. So we, that suggests that we ought to be steering innovation. In particular, in one of my earlier papers, I showed that there was a bias towards labor replacing innovation. So there was a bias on the private side to reduce uh, labor costs and create, as a result, more unemployment. Now, what we've seen in the last 10 years as society, as individuals get more focused on climate change, that we've had enormous successes in, for instance, reducing the cost of renewable energy. It's not an accident. Most of those innovations do not, have not depended on uh, discoveries that have been made in the last 10 years. Most of those discoveries, or at least a large fraction of the discoveries, could have been made 20 or 30 years ago. Why didn't we make it? Because we weren't thinking about that issue. We didn't have the market signals, but we, it wasn't viewed as a societal priority. To me, one of the most optimistic, we said, well, let's have some optimism here, is how far we've gone in reducing the cost of renewable energy in the face of very little pushing on the part of government, very weak policy. And yet we've achieved enormous, well, there has been a lot of, of societal attention. Young people see the issue of saving the planet as uh, an uh, uh, absolutely existential issue. And so that's, uh, it's nice that so many people have devoted that kind of energy, but we've, enormous success with a, just a little bit of steering. And that leads me to say, well, what would happen if we had more steering? Now, what are the tools uh, that we have? Well, there are a number of tools. Uh, one of the basic tools is basic research is basically supported by government. <laughs> the mRNA vaccine was ready to go in a sense because we had invested as a society through basic research in developing the platform, the idea. And uh, we could be spending a lot more of our basic research and ideas that would save the planet rather than save unskilled labor. So public investment is the first pillar. The second one is pricing. Uh, some of the pricing is quite obvious. We don't price carbon. I mentioned the social cost of carbon. And if we don't price carbon, we have no incentive to innovate. We have limited incentive uh, to innovate. 
And so having uh, a price of carbon would divert more of the AI and other kinds of resource research resources toward saving the planet rather than creating more unemployment. Regulations have some of the same role. If we say um, you're going to have a you you have to meet these targets, like we did in the automobile, that has that's like uh, economists would say is creating a shadow price, but uh, that's a peculiar language that economists use. The fact is that directs research to meeting that goal and enormous amount of success uh, uh, in doing that. But we also have to recognize that unintentionally for the most part, we've been steering innovation in the wrong way. So examples are the uh, the Federal Reserve went in, sex the interest rate at zero. What is it doing? It's saying the cost of capital is zero. That's not the scarcity value of capital, but it's the cost of capital. So a firm deciding whether it should do innovation to save capital or to save labor is encouraged to save labor. So we are encouraging labor replacing innovation by our monetary policy. At the other side, the fact that we impose so many taxes on labor and we give preferential treatment to capital gains and to all kinds of capital taxation does exactly the same thing. So many of our tax policies are discriminate, not, uh, you know, we, we have always talked about how they hurt labor relative to capital in a static context. In this context of steering innovation, they're also encouraging innovation to save labor, to create more unemployment, rather than to save capital, which would, the effect of which would be, with less capital required per unit of output, there'd be more capital investment that would increase productivity and that would increase wages. Those are great examples and I hope uh, that we will find more ways to inspire and encourage our AI researchers and developers and entrepreneurs to engage in more innovations in directions that use labor and that bring us together. Now, let me turn to another core expertise of yours, Joe. You made some of your greatest research contributions in the economics of information. In fact, that's what you earned the 2001 Nobel Prize for. And I should say, I still remember how you dutifully showed up to teach our first year graduate course that very morning when you got the call from the <laughs> Nobel Committee. Um, but yeah, so speaking about information economics, the traditional focus has been on incomplete information. But as we observed before, advances in digital technology and AI have really led to a rise in misinformation rather than just asymmetric information, and particularly in the context of social networks. How do you view this development as an expert in the economics of information? And perhaps the most difficult question, what can we do to better equip our society to deal with this? Well, I am very worried. <laughs> um, analytically, um, most of my research was based on the predicate that there were asymmetries of information, but we had legal frameworks that meant that when you disclosed information, it was truthful. We're now moved into a world where there is extensive mis- and disinformation. Now, in some of my earlier work, I actually explored the that the uh, incentives for mis- and disinformation. Uh, I wrote a paper with my colleague, uh, Bruce Greenwald, on why it is that we need to have fraud laws to stop mis- and disinformation. We all know that we want good uh, laws uh, uh, of truth in advertising. Um, you know, so, so it's been a 
in the back of our mind that uh, the market on its own isn't able to solve these information problems and we need legal frameworks to encourage truth. Uh, as another example, we know that disinformation can do harm. And that's why we have libel laws that uh, 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 allow for a suit on what are called torts uh, associated with, with uh, misinform and disinformation. One of the mistakes that we made, understandable at the time, was to exempt the platforms from intermediary liability. That was section 230. And this has unleashed uh, a uh, level of mis and disinformation that was unfathomable. Partly because, and here's where AI plays an, a rather negative role, AI is able to identify who wants to, uh, would be receptive to different messages. And so what we, we have now is a market which is very non-transparent because no one knows who's getting what message. And the business model is engagement and underlying engagement is enragement. And underlying enragement is polarization. So the business model of AI in the United States has been polarization. They've made money out of polarizing our society. Now, it hasn't been as bad as it's been in some countries like Myanmar, where it, it, Facebook has been central in creating genocide. So we fortunately don't have that, but they played a role in the insurrection on January 6th. They played a negative role in a whole range of digital harms. The, there are things that we can do about this and still be consistent with our commitments to free speech, free press, our, our First Amendment. We've always recognized that we need to balance those protections with societal harms. You can't we, we have restrictions on childhood pornography, crying fire in a crowded theater, theater. So we know that we may need to rebalance those concerns in light of the enormous social harms. And there was never a guarantee on virality. That was never part of our First Amendment rights. Now, uh, of course, uh, you might say the, it was a flaw of the uh, forms of the Constitution not to think about virality. But that, of course, was not conceivable. <laughs> and so that, that's an example of where original uh, intent uh, is absurd uh, in uh, reading into the Constitution. Interestingly, Europe is now making great progress in thinking through these issues better than we've been doing. And um, I know that uh, Macron, uh, Macron under the presidency, uh, French presidency, the EU, hopes that they will pass, pass two uh, pieces of legislation, the Digital Marketing Act and the Digital Services Act, both to ensure more competition, but also to protect against these digital harms. Mm -hmm. What you're describing are really quite massive externalities that AI is creating our society and presumably since there are externalities uh, that are quite inefficient. Exactly. Now, now um, we've been talking about the redistributions generated by AI. Uh, one concern that I'm particularly worried about is the implications of these redistributions for developing countries. Uh, what do you view as the main concerns there? And what do you think is it that advanced countries like the US could do to help? Well, I am very concerned. We, we talked about before uh, how in principle um, 
advances in technology, including AI, could make everybody better off, produce more output with the same input, better products, so forth. And what we said, though, is the market may make some group worse off, but we could, could not necessarily will, we could redistribute from those who are the gainers to those who are the losers to make everybody better off. But mm -hmm. when the gainers are in one country and the losers are in another country, that kind of redistribution is much more difficult, maybe impossible. And that is the concern about uh, developing countries and AI because, and innovation more generally. Uh, innovation in its current form is having the effect of saving on unskilled labor. We have talked about labor replacing. What is the labor replacing is routine workers. What is the asset that is abundant in developing countries? It's raw labor, it's unskilled labor. And so you're decreasing the value of the asset that is the core asset of developing countries. And you, many of the innovations are going to be also saving on resources. We're committed to addressing the, bio, uh, the problem of climate change. There are a large fraction of the developing countries that are uh, deriving much of their income from oil, gas, and other fossil fuels. Now, there are some countries like Bolivia that may benefit as they lose from gas, they may benefit from lithium. So there are going to be some materials that they'll gain from, but there will be, so this is an example of the, the, the distributive effects can be very complex, but there will be some big losers. And uh, that can have, uh, that will have uh, very big global implications. I mean, just think of what will happen in those parts of the world, Middle East, that depend on natural resources, or those parts of the world in which uh, unskilled labor is the main asset that they have. Uh, I just worry about uh, the uh, wages being pushed down to subsistence levels, unemployment, and political and social unrest, migration pressures, it is hard to believe that uh, these inequalities won't have consequences beyond the borders of these countries. Now, what can the advanced countries do? Well, there are two things uh, that they can do. One of them harks back to uh, what we were talking about a minute ago, steering innovation. We could try to steer innovation in ways that uh, do not harm them as much, do not undermine, you know, that may act, enable them actually to become more productive with their endowments of unskilled labor. So that would actually be uh, uh, enhancing the returns to the, the uh, very low unskilled labor that they have. The other thing obviously we can do is uh, some form of forms of assistance of a, a variety of kinds. One of the um, tools we have uh, is the special drawing rights uh, of the IMF, uh, uh, kind of IMF money that we can grant essentially no cost to American taxpayers or taxpayers in other countries. We did that in the midst of the pandemic, $650 billion. Uh, my view is that we ought to do it on an annual basis and target it towards the developing countries and emerging markets with a commitment that the rules of the game of these SDRs is they go in proportion to the quotas. That means a large fraction uh, majority go to countries that don't need it, but they could recycle it to the countries that do need it uh, in ways that would uh, enhance their development. Thank you, Joe. We have already almost arrived at the end of our fireside chat, but let me ask you one final question. 
uh, we have emphasized that it's not a given that progress will proceed in the right direction and how high the stakes involved are and so on. So I wanted to ask you, do you have one actionable piece of advice for our audience, or perhaps one for policymakers, one for innovators, on what they can tangibly do to steer technological progress in a desirable direction? Well, I, I think that um, typically innovators don't think through the social consequences of their innovation. And uh, the big advantage of a market economy and the basic theorems, welfare theorems is normally we say, you don't have to do that. Just look at what maximizes your profit. Adam Smith's theorem was that if you maximize, do what is best for you, you do what is best for society. In this area, it is clearly not true. So both policymakers and innovators, firms, need to think a little bit more deeply about the full consequences of what they're doing. And ask the question, if everybody acted like I do, the golden rule, what would our society be like? Thank you, Joe. And thank you for joining us today and for inspiring generations of economists and policymakers and technologists with the work that you're doing. And as you have been listening to our conversation today, I hope that you have also found inspiration and actionable insights so that all of us together can work towards steering technological progress in a direction that benefits everyone and that strengthens our society and reflects our values. I hope that you'll join us again for future events in this series. And now let me give a round of virtual applause to Cho. Thank you again. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.